So Joel, when someone comes into you with a neurological voice disorder, um, they come in with a diagnosis of spasmodic dysphonia. What do you what do you do first? Well, first we listen to their voice. You know, only when or with, once when the patient comes in to see us, uh, we talk to them and we get a history from them. And during that history taking and listening to their story, we're listening to their voice. And when we're listening to their voice, we're listening to the quality of their voice. And spasmodic dysphonia has a certain type of uh, sound, we call it prosody or uh, speech quality, uh, that we can hear and we can hear breaks or we can hear breathiness and we can diagnose that uh, problem often during the initial interview. When you say we, who's we? So in our clinic, we see patients in a, what we call a multidisciplinary approach. So we see patients with uh, speech pathologists. Often there's also a nurse practitioner, some residents. We have a large group that uh, sees the patient. Uh, and we all come to a consensus of uh, to what's going on. Would you say that when you were a resident, when you were in training, you would have been able to make that sort of diagnosis? Uh, not always. Uh, it does take a lot of training to learn about spasmodic dysphonia. Learning how to listen to voices is something that we do in the laryngology and the voice world. Uh, we spend a lot of time listening to patients and listening to what's happening. I can say, at least from my perspective, that when I was a resident, I had very little uh, idea for sure about what spasmodic dysphonia was, who the patients were, et cetera. Um, and that really only by uh, interacting with them and seeing more and more and more um, that I began to feel comfortable. But I agree with you that getting having a consensus is helpful. Um, a team will always uh, a team will always pick up different little um, elements of refinement of someone's voice and maybe pick up things that you wouldn't have picked up yourself. And spasmodic dysphonia is often a disorder that's well treated medically, not so much with uh, therapy or behavioral management techniques that the speech pathologists do. But that said, there are exceptions and plenty of exceptions to that rule that I've seen. And, and there are definitely some patients who will treat with botulinum toxin uh, therapy, but will get some benefit, uh, to, the term is to unload them or to relax the way that they're voicing. Uh, with voice therapy, and so it's a combination of approaches, and I wouldn't get that combination of approach if I didn't have a speech pathologist that saw them. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most uh, con easily confused voice disorders with spasmodic dysphonia? Muscle tension dysphonia is the most common disorder, and muscle tension disorder, we define it by some of its response to treatment. Uh, we treat this what kind uh, of treatment? with a behavioral approach with uh, a speech pathologist, and okay. we can often mimic it. Um, a lot of us do this in our clinics all day long. We, we kind of make these tight voices, and, and that is a form of muscle tension dysphonia. And patients, for whatever reasons we don't really understand, they get kind of locked into these tension patterns, and usually with uh, some uh, relaxing type of sp uh, voice therapy, uh, patients can get into a normal more, uh, voicing pattern. What do you think about uh, voice therapy? Is voice, if someone comes in and says, you know, uh, I was referred here because I have some sort of voice disorder, I was told I need voice therapy, and they said it would be, you know, a 30-minute session and then I'd be cured. Does that sound right to you? Or? No. Voice therapy, unfortunately, is a process. And, uh, and sometimes when patients come in with the attitude that it's only going to work in a session or two, they, they get frustrated. And they'll, and sometimes we see patients that have had a session of voice therapy and they say it didn't work and all the speech pathologist told me was to kind of go mm, mm, mm. And I point out to them, well, saying mm, mm, mm is, a, is a good relaxing technique, but the ultimate goal is to get you to talk. And so we need to spend the time to transition some of the exercises to ultimate voicing and speech in our day-to-day -day activities. Okay. What if someone says to you, um uh, I have, uh, you know, I have a sister and a mom with, uh, with something similar to what I've got. What, is, does that, what does that trigger for you? Does that mean anything or is that useless information? What does that mean? Sometimes it's useful, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes there are patterns that people learn in families, uh, uh, almost not related to spasmodic dysphonia, but uh, we certainly see uh, mothers and daughters that sometimes talk in the, the same way. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there, there are some patients with spasmodic dysphonia that uh, have, uh, ha have it in their families. In fact, I have a patient uh, whose uh, 
uh, I have a mother and son team uh, who comes in for their botulinum toxin injection uh -huh. every visit, uh, and they certainly have the same sort of dyspho dysphonia, which is a spasmodic dysphonia. They get different dosing on their Botox, interestingly enough, though. <laughs> okay, so some similar, some different. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, when you are uh, making a diagnosis, what are the what are the components that you uh, include? You said something about you know history and. Uh, maybe some tasks and physical exam. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more? So we like to listen to their voice and then we like to tax it. Uh, we like to ha stress the system and listen to how they voice with certain types of weighted sentences. Uh, so things that are weighted with a lot of um, uh, tightened uh, vocal closures uh, are things like... You mean we, like vowels? And like, yeah, like okay. prolonged vowels or we eat eels every Easter. Uh, some patients have trouble with that. On the other hand, some patients with an abductive variety of uh, voice problems may have trouble with uh, real sounds that are made while the voice box is relaxing, like Peter will keep at the peak. And they might say, Peter will keep at the peak. Um, and, and so we do these weighted sentences to, to sort of tax the system and, and listen to what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we do a laryngoscopy. We look at the larynx. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to see what the end organ is doing. Oftentimes, it's to rule out other problems. Uh, there are certainly other uh, uh, problems that uh, happen in the voice box that can parallel uh, some of the things we hear. And so we want to make sure that uh, we don't see any of these other uh, issues going on. And sometimes people even have secondary diagnoses. You know, if a patient smokes uh, or has a lot of uh, reflux, for instance, you'll see a lot of inflammation in the larynx. And while the inflammation is not probably the source of the problem, it is certainly something that could be addressed or treated. Mm -hmm.